It's time for Horsepower, Chrome and Rust, the greatest automotive podcast in the known world with Ron Foreman, Brady Wright, and Steve Johan. Let's find out what's going on this week. <laughs> I'll tell you what's going on this week. You'll notice by the video, if you're looking at video, that there's only two of us. And the reason for that is that Ron Foreman, our co-host, Ron came home from work today and his canopy that covers his truck was blown basically on top of his shop because they had a lot of wind out where he lives so ron's yeah. probably not going to be here no. we're going to wait and see if he joins the zoom meeting but we're not holding our breath on ron and we wish him well his no, no damn i mean nobody got hurt but uh it did blow out his pellet stove and he says his house full of smoke oh, so gosh. he's gonna have some cleanup to do and uh you know we wish him well i said i'd drive over and do it but it's a five-hour drive so well maybe... and I, I i'm i'm here in the show i'm i'm here in the office and i'm not uh, gonna head over there anytime soon but we were talking well, before yeah. the air why why didn't he have it you know down with spikes well and yeah said we, oh, we talked about all of that yeah so, i talked anyway about I, t I talked with him about an hour and a half ago you'll, and he's you'll have a good story not next a happy week. guy <laughs> so it is tuesday it's january 26th it is 2021 brady wright and steve johan tonight ron foreman of course our co-host fixing his house millions of people listening we all know you're out there and we really appreciate you doing the like and follow of our facebook page and our our youtube channel now and of course you know we're on podomatic we're on spotify we're on iheart radio now we're on me we which is one of the new social networks we're also got a presence on gab.com excellent uh parlor is dead so we're not going to be on parlor nope, anymore nope. but uh we're working on getting with everybody we're trying to get on rumble i think we'll be there pretty quick um no matter where you get your podcast Podcasts. Look us up. Horsepower Chrome and Rust has been around for three years. We're coming up on, well, pre getting pretty close to 200 shows. Yes, so we are. That's yeah, nice. Are. As usual, we do a segment. The first one we do is called Back to the Blacktop. And that's where Steve comes up with all kinds of cool stuff that he has found from his many, many sources of what's going on in the automotive world. So what's going on this week? Well, there's two big announcements coming from the new administration. First is... Oh. Biden vowed Monday to adhere to the strict Buy America procurement policy for purchasing products such as cars and trucks used by federal government. The federal government spends as much as $600 billion annually on procurements. Oh, so yeah. this is a big business, big business partner with all the American car manufacturers, truck manufacturers. And, and you know, that's good. You're buying America. That's, that's good. So he's sure. just renewing, hey, Folks, we're going to keep buying American. We're not going to buy, you know, Mazdas or Toyotas. So good for good news for for the manufacturers. And, and remember, it's all taxpayer dollars here. So that's that's uh, that's keeping our economy flow. Second, one of Biden's top concerns is climate change, with plans to address tailpipe emissions, fuel economy, and push for electric vehicles, which will be complicated, according to this report, by the transportation secretary nom nominee. Pete Buttigieg, who reminded a Senate panel today the federal highway fund <clears throat> coffers are nearly empty. So I'm They gonna, aren't, of course. They aren't. And my prediction is they that aren't. there isn't. And this is just another way to add more money, add more, you know, to the to the coffers. But no, come on, there's always money set aside for the National Highway Safety Traffic. Uh, administration and all the things they do that's never yeah, been Yeah, unless defunded. they want to bleed it off into some other ridiculous fund, which... Well, maybe it... Maybe so. Maybe it could know. have been. I don't know. But anyway, that's what he's saying. So, you know, they're they're already setting a president. Now, Brady, I didn't know this, but did you know CarMax actually sold new cars? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You did? I thought they only sold used cars. Oh, no. Yeah, you can buy a new car there. Well, they've just made an announcement that their 220 outlets will only sell used cars from this point on. They're closing oh, all okay. their new well, car. They're going to sell off all their new cars. More used cars and there are new cars, and certainly it's a there's more markup that way. So it makes good sense, business yep. decision. Yep. And I always thought it was new uh, used cars, but that yeah. was kind of an interesting thing to me. So I, I learned something. And then rest in peace, Dave Power. We've all heard of J.D. Power. It, it right. is it is the uh, the big granddaddy in the industry. Well, the company um, uh, that Dave launched launched a revolution. Started in his kitchen with he and his wife, and yep. they helped make the essential part of automotive manufacturing what it is. And the founder just uh, died. But it, it was all about quality, 
So it, 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 they rate individual cars by quality, kind of like what the Consumer Report Card Report Guide does. Well, they did it for uh, automotive, and they also yep. were used by, yep. hey, how well do you do as a dealership and all that? But anyway, he passed away in 89, so he got many years in there. and Had a good uh, run. He did. And the good <laughs> news for Lotus fans, the company just announced it is set to launch a complete new line of upcoming cars, including their $2 million a pop, 200 mile per hour all electric sports car slated to show up in 2022 so now look here again i almost didn't want to report this because we can't see something that they're saying they're going to do but apparently uh, lotus was bought out by china's geely company which actually owns volvo among other brands and it yep. has promised to continually pump in new money they've opened up a new manufacturing plant and we're hopes that this pipe dream will actually become a reality and they'll have a handful of new models out here within the next year or so. So Money laundering. I'm sorry. I'm sure it'll be <laughs> exciting. I'm looking forward to it. And, uh, you know, Lotus is a pretty, uh, a pretty time-honored name. And they produced some real interesting cars yeah, back in the day. So I'll be interested to see what they do. It will. And it's funny you say money, la money laundering, but, you know, I've got a lot of, I got my IRA set in the Wall Street. Well, Wall Street's probably 70% money laundering. So let's just be honest. It goes on whether we know it or not. And Mazda has just announced it has formally abandoned the idea of high mileage diesel engines being sold in the U.S. in yeah. any of their vehicles. They had one slated. It was approved. And I think with this whole kerfuffle of, fly. Of, of diesel, no diesel, blah, 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 yeah. and with the yeah. hardcore emissions thing coming up, they're saying, nope, let's just from the day one forget and it. And that was a big step sideways for Mazda anyway. Yeah, it That's was. not where they made their bones, their cars. I mean, it's not. It's really not a line that you know would work for them. If they had a truck, I could yeah. see, yeah. okay. But, you know, they don't have one that's that's competitive, so not a thing. They should stick with sedans and SUVs, crossovers. Yes. They're really, really good at that. Yep. And they got a nice little um, pickup truck, too. Their little Mazda pickup. It's so okay. Yeah. yeah. It's not bad. I mean, my son's got a 80, uh, let's see, a 92, and it's a great little car, great little truck. And he loves it. I love driving it. And then last here, um, online auctions are going strong with the first of the year. RM Sotheby's seeing $35 million worth of car cars yeah. sold at 90% uh sell rate which is really good and led by historic period raced uh 1955 jaguar d type at at six million dollars so there's money you know whenever there is well people like shopping from home it's like it's like buying stuff on amazon except it costs you two million dollars or six million dollars or six or, or whatever but there's money right now to be had and there are sectors of the market <laughs> that have gone down that have crashed because of Oh my gosh! So here we go. Um, Did you break something? No, I just launched the record the video section. So now we're oh, good. recording. So so our video show. If you're watching the video show, the reason you didn't see it up until now is that Steve forgot to turn it on. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> so anyway, shoot myself in the head there. Steve is the producer yes. of the show. He's and the I told tech myself. Guy. Okay. He's supposed to know. I told myself, don't stuff. forget to do this. But there was a log. Anyway, I won't explain why. <laughs> um, but, you know, speaking of um, really interesting things we were talking at the very beginning, you're always announcing where we're heard, where our show's heard. Sure. Well, I got a notice from my um, podcast uh, service provider yeah. where, I, where um, I place all of our podcast originally, and then they get dispersed to... 15 sure. to 20 different podcast outfits. Yep. Well, I've got another big one that we're going to be on here shortly, and there's some really exciting news. So here in a week or so, I'll be able to announce where we're also located. So, Oh, very good. I think it's Are really we talking cool. another service or another another, uh, another platform. Oh, good. Yep, oh, good. Another app. More uh, the barrier. It is. and uh, Pretty soon, we will be everywhere. Well, and we I've, will got be Hydra. Some, I've got some plans for some interesting things here in the next few months I'm going to be rolling out. And one of them is going to be some uh, clothing. Oh, nice. We we need clothing. Clothing yes. would be good. Well, listen, I, we would really appreciate you tuning in. Coming up on Windshield View, we are going to decide, we're going to tell you how we actually got here. And I'm not talking about Steve and me. Stick with us. Fear. 
<laughs> hey, this is the second half. Well, it's the first half of the second segment of the show. This is the windshield view. This is where we talk about all kinds of cool stuff that's coming up from the automotive world. And usually at this point, we have a guest and, and we have guests all the time. But one of the reasons that Steve and I and Ron, we started doing this show is because we love cars and we love everything that has to do with wheels and, you know, internal combustion engines and all that kind of stuff. And we're glad to be able to share all that stuff with you. But, you know, we got to thinking and it's dangerous when oh, yeah. Steve yeah. gets to thinking because <laughs> stuff comes out. Yeah. Yes. He said, you know, <clears throat> cars, of course, are, you know, a huge part of the American culture have been since the day. But before there were cars, there were other vehicles that were powered. And before there were internal combustion engines, there was other ways of getting around. Since man has had the wheel back XAD. They've been continually looking for ways to power it, to go farther, to go faster. That's just been the thing, whether it was horses or donkeys or steam or, you know, rubber bands or whatever it was. The quest to move people and goods farther and faster and more efficiently is one of the big reasons why civilization exists and why wars were fought and won and technological marvels happened and got spread around. It's kind of a cool story. So this week we thought, you know what? Let's take a look at what kind of started the whole car culture. And of course, you can't do that without taking a look at the internal combustion engine. That's and right. Steve was turned loose with his research yes. computer. Yes. And I'm terrified, to be honest with you, to oh, see gosh. what he's come up with. But I know it's going to be fun. So what do you got, my friend? Well, I came up with the internal combustion motor has, been a, has had a profound effect upon civilization and just like you said, I thought I would do a little brief history of how it came to be. And I think it's very interesting. I came across so much stuff that I had no clue of, and I think our listeners are going to really enjoy tonight. Well, when researching this topic, I discovered a Greek engineer by the name of Hero Alexandria, circa 100 AD, experimented with steam and invented the Aleo Alea pile, the first but very crude steam engine. We had files. The, the a, 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 e, o. Stop. Spill anyway, it. was a metal sphere mounted on top of a boiling water kettle. Got the it. steam traveled through pipes to the sphere. The two L-shaped tubes on opposite sides of the sphere released steam, which gave a thrust to the sphere that caused it to rotate. However, Hero never realized the potential of the device and centuries were passed before a practical steam engine could be invented. So here we are talking 100 AD, and they already, you know, they already had instruments like musical instruments, tubes, and all that. They had all this technology. Sure. And he said, "What if I heat this thing up, this tea kettle?" And 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 off he goes. He sees some some there, but that was locked away, probably hidden in the. Uh, what, we just the, couldn't figure out a, a way to use no, it. No, no. There's a lot of there's a lot of technology that gets invented that. It's ahead of its time. Like, this is really cool, but I don't know what to do with it. So I'll just set it over here until I come up with a reason to well, make it. Well, and it, it was literally 1,600 years, or, yeah, 1,600 1, years later. It wasn't until yeah. 1698 when English engineer Thomas Savory patented the first crude steam engine, which he used to pump water out of a coal mine. And right. Still, and, you know, work engines... Uh, this is were the, key. the kind of thing that got used a lot in construction and mining and things like you're talking yes. about. But they hadn't quite figured out, well, if it'll do that, if it'll move weights from one place to another, would it not move weights with wheels? They That's just right. hadn't quite got there. It's fun yeah. to watch that stuff. It is. So by 1712, English engineer and blacksmith Thomas Newcomb invented the atmospheric steam engine, which was also used to pump water from mines. And I think right. there's this little theme going through there as mining was huge, and water getting in the mine was a huge problem. So they needed a device to be able to pump it out before they would hand bilge type thing and pump it out by water, you know, like yeah. they've done on ships forever. Well, then they, hey, we got something that we can, and all of a sudden they're pulling the water out. Well, That's then, awesome. Hey, before you go on, yes. can you hear the buzzing in the background here? Yes, I can. There's some construction going on next door. Oh, and okay. So just in case you wonder, it's nothing wrong with your set. It's nothing wrong with your computer. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> All right. 
Well, in 1765, a Scottish engineer by the names of James Watt began studying Thomas Newcomb's steam engine and invented an improved version. It right. was Watt's engine that was first to have a rotary motion and opened the doors to use of the steam engine, which became widespread. Right. So by now, the he was also the guy who invented the first engine crank. Yes. So he could James Watt, 1782. Har har harness and start making that thing work. Yeah. Um, and, and so he did this, and by the late 1700s, inventors applied steam power to trains and boats and much later cars. So you think right. about that. Trains became a huge, huge factor in, right. in, in, and, in, and in everything. Not only, well, of course, trains, most of them were coal or steam powered, and That's that was a right. big, you know, big deal. But the thing that got us to internal combustion engines was an invention by a French engineer. You know who well, I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, but that's going to be later. Not the, much later. Well, but the Not much. No, no. The major changes, uh, challenges with steam-powered engines was their constant need for fuel, as in coal, wood, right. and water, and the yep. amount of soot put out by, put out by the, uh, the smokestacks. Sure. That and would, the fact that water, as a fuel, I mean, as a, as a burning agent, it used itself up pretty quick. Very quick. You know, so you had to constantly have more of it. And you had to, ha yes, you had to have a, a, a yep. coal car, you had to have a water car, you right. had to have all this stuff in line. So it opened the doors for gas-powered cousin <clears throat> to enter the picture. Right. And and so keep in mind, steam has never went away. It has been used even to oh, this sure. day to power power plants. Used and everybody to... knows the Stanley Steamer, of course. You oh, know, yes. The, the car that, you know, made that. But that, he wasn't the first of the no, steam we'll cars get to that. either. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So then um, today, steam is used for powering um, energy plants, and, and their source of energy is coal, sure. nuke, uh, natural gas, and primary and or nuke. And then, right. introduction of the gasoline-powered engine. The first attempt to create a non-steam-powered engine was Abbey Hotfield, described in 1678, an engineer for raising water, once again for raising water out of mines, right. in which the motive power was obtained by burning gunpowder in a cylinder and cooling the remaining gases with water, similar to that expressed in the earlier forms of the steam engine. The same idea was suggested in 1680 by H-U-Y-G-E-N-S, but experiments made by him and later by Dennis Papenware were proved to be unsuccessful Ugh, unsuccessful, but it wasn't until the distillation of gasoline from coal did the idea really come back. So and petroleum products. Petroleum products. About That's 1791, John Barber explained in a patent how a wheel with veins could be driven by a released pressure of an orifice right. closed to the veins, but again, nothing of significance took place. And it wasn't until 1794 that Robert Street applied for a patent and designed the bottom of a cylinder was heated by fire and a small quantity of tar and turpentine was projected into the hot part of the cylinder forming a vapor. Right. The right. rising of the piston sucked in the quality quantity of air to form an explosion. The mixture would go down, the flame for ignition, and the cycle was now formed of the internal combustion of flame pop up, push down. Sure. So then it became uh, successful. By 1800, Philip Lebanon, Lebon, patent in France, an engine using compressed air, compressed gas, and electricity for ignition. But due to the early death, again, development was pretty much stalled for another 50 years. It wasn't until 1833 by L. W. L. Wright in England that the gas and air were supplied by separate pumps to a working cylinder. The combination or the combustion was contained in a spherical bulbs near the ends of the cylinder, ignition occurring while the pistons with end of the stroke. The engine was double acting, water jacketed with pop poppeted exhaust valves and fly ball governor. It represented the next generation. And well, there's our music. I'm That's just right. getting into. We're going to do more of this. He has just barely scratched yeah. the surface. Do not panic. We know that part two of the windshield view is coming right back on horsepower chrome and rust. Yeah. Back in vehicle city. 
Yes, we are. We're back in Vehicle City with the second half of the windshield view on horsepower chrome and rust. And we, I started talking about the history of the internal combustion um, engine. And Brady did a little couple corrections for me. So this time around, I'm going to kind of mm, pick it up. You're going to be fine. We're going to be and, fine. And while you, while you do this, I'm going to feed French fries to my dogs because <laughs> they're right here. <laughs> yes, folks. He has a, he's still know, living you know in what? his, uh, his uh, stay-at-home apartment, oh, no, would... <laughs> extended stay apartment there until his yeah. house closes. So No, it's all good. Oh, good. That's okay. Human too? Oh, they, they like it. Yes, all right. All. Well, anyway, here we go. So, so we left off with you talking about some uh, European guys who had just come up with the idea yes, of a, I want to say a reciprocating, reciprocating engine. Reciprocating engine. At the top, power at the bottom, and so on. Yes. But these were, now correct me if I'm wrong, these were motors engines that stationary at this point point have any valves no way to actually control the power just in and out basically right 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 well their valves in some cases were actually on the outside external and they would pump in air pump in the the fuel mixture and yet they had all these different devices of trying to ignite it trying to keep the 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 pump going up going down my question down my question is going to be that, and you, we're now in the early 1800s. Yes. So at this point, the way that these things are being um, uh, ignited is essentially an introduction of fire through a port. Yep. So it's we're getting up to the point where the spark plug itself is being introdu- uh, uh, invented, and at that point motors became really a fully self-contained sort of device. I know you're going to get there, but I just wanted to make sure that people understood. We haven't really got to what classically is called an internal combustion engine no, just yet. No. They're combusting, but it's not all internal, and that that's coming up, right? It is. It is. Cool. And, and when it, do we it, get to Hemi's? Well, <laughs> that'll be part three. <laughs> it was the well-known auto engine invented by Nicholas Otto of Germany in 1877, that came about, he built the four-cycle motor, ah. or sometimes known as the auto cycle. The engine was the first sure. known as the auto silent to distinguish it from the free piston engine, which was rather noisy. So these things were clanking, clanking. His system was a lot too, more internal, so a lot more quieter. And a lot of this was before you know, efficient bearings and you know, ways to, I mean, you know, th- this was real primitive stuff. Real. Um, and again, no spark plug per se, so everything was external. And the idea of you know intake, compression, power, exhaust, that was just just now coming coming into the fore. Well, it was. And my neighbor, he's a he's a big uh, proponent of buying these old style single horse uh, gas powered pumps that were used for farms and stuff, and these big, sure. gigantic piston yeah. things. And and you look at these things and you're like that was just one horse, but it was it, it was how it yeah. was used. And so yeah, right. the evolution really took place. It was um, it in its design, it proved to be the most reliable, and soon established the internal combustion engine on a firm footing. The right. engines of today are just modifications of the basic four cycle engine he invented sure. in 1877. Soon the sliding valve was replaced by poppet valves, and the flame ignition was ex- was replaced by the electric spark, which is the spark plug. Right. And and so I've seen... And that was 1860, 1877, 1877. Yep. So, I mean, I, we're still talking in the 1800s. We're, we're not right. even into the 1900s. Right. Barely after the Civil War. That's right. So then when did engines <clears throat> become be used to propel a vehicle come about well it goes back to william murdoch who ran a model steam carriage on the roads of cornwall in 1784 right and robert forness who demonstrated a working three-cylinder steam tractor in 1788 by 1800 now listen to this by 1800 steam buses were running in paris that's pretty amazing right but it wasn't till the rise of the steam locomotive that really changed the face of transportation, be it hauling logs for lumber, um, mills, and coal, and people. Trains soon transformed the entire planet because now you could transform. You lay the tracks, and all of a sudden you had nonstop right. 
huge but volumes. most of this most of the use for these engines up to this point had been industrial industrial or all or, industrial i want to say work engines they were things that that powered things that were necessary well like a bus or a tr railroad train or something along those lines a, a big the mules... idea of yes. personal now transportation come a personal little bit conveyance. later hasn't even come up yet. Nope, no, hasn't they haven't even come up. Just... And it's fascinating that they that they would take it from industrial uses, you know. And eventually, somebody gets the idea. Aha! I need one of these for me. Well, and Cromwell was doing like <clears throat> I said back in uh, back in 1784, but it was a demonstration. Yeah, it was an invention. It, 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 it was, was an invention. people probably looked at it and went, "That's crazy." They adapted it for the tractor much quicker because oh, sure. they could pull things again a work engine. Uh, work engine. Yes. And, and and so again, so then while it was taking place, the precursor of the modern automobile was also taking shape in the light steam cars, which were being built in the United States, France, Germany, and Denmark. Right. And here's an interesting thing. Did you know that at the beginning of the 20th century, and so we, we're kind of jumping ahead here, but by the t beginning of the 20th century, 40% of American automobiles were powered by steam. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 38% were by electricity. And 22% by gasoline. As a matter of fact, in the um, LeMay Museum in uh, the south end of Seattle, there is an electric car and the electric charging station that was made and operated, including the charging station, in like 1901. Yes, we're going to talk. And it was yes. way ahead of, way. Uh, obviously, of its time. Yeah. But also, it was ahead of the... Uh, gasoline-powered vehicles, you know, of the time, the only challenge, of course, was the same ones that Tesla is having now, and that is, how many charging stations do you have, where are they, and and how long does it take to charge the vehicle? <clears throat> but that technology is not new. No, no, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, I won't go down the rabbit trail, but let's just put it this way. <laughs> Thanks to these spare electric motors that were around, um, R.J. Letourneau turned it into what we know as the earth-moving industry. Right. Um, during right. these early days, the motor car, the gasoline's car, was pretty unreliable. It was noisy and vibrated a lot. The steamer's complications were a thirst um, for, for fuel, again, noisy, sooty. Yeah. And, and that's where the electric offered an attractive selling points, notably self-start, silent operation, and minimal maintenance. And so it was the first uh, electrics were the first automobiles to exceed 60 miles per hour in an electric, uh, yeah. in a race. And that was in 1899. And again, as cool as that is, it was still a novelty. Uh, but it listen. was still um, a, yes. a demonstration piece. Hadn't quite gotten to personal use yet. It's well, fascinating how that stuff comes. It, it was, but at its first popularity, the electric car was hampered by a lack of battery charging infrastructure. Right. But by 1910, and, 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 and prior to 1910, Few private homes, even in the cities, were wired with electricity. Right. And community charging stations and battery uh, exchange schemes had failed. It wasn't until 1912 that the problem had been o overcome, and the electric car had its heyday with 20 companies competing with each other, and upward of 33,000 electric cars were registered in the United States that year. That's a now, lot. That's it's a lot, but let's let's put that in perspective. 1912. In 1913, the year after that, there was the first time that more than a million cars, automobiles of any sort of power, were registered in the United States. That's right. So a million cars at that time was quite a bit. 33,000 of them were electric. That's an interesting statistic. A full third. You well, know, as we that's, said, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and here that's it says, a lot. But it wasn't to last very long, due in part by the same issues as you t you mentioned earlier, yep. is the yep. EV makers of today, which is short range, lengthy time required for recharging. Right. And with the adoption of electric system starters and gas-powered cars, the idea of cranking a car now became sure. a, a way of the past, much like when they added electric starters to motorcycles, all these new right. people came in. Well, so by 1920, all the electrics went away. They went the way of the dodo bird and the gasoline powered car really took hold. Well, also the other piece of that is that big oil began to be a lot more powerful. Oh yeah. And you see that made a huge difference because they wanted to sell petroleum products and the electrical industry didn't have the infrastructure to do that. So they kind of got, yes. you know, beat up. I was going to back up and ask you when you were talking about, um, 
uh, just a second ago, the the number of cars that were, yeah, what a second ago you said, yeah, I, I basically said this, that at um, the okay, here. the first turn of the century, we're talking nineteen hundred, um, twenty uh, forty percent of American automobiles were powered by steam, thirty eight no, 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 by electricity, that. and twenty two by gasoline. It was after that. We after ta after talking about nineteen twelve statistic. And da, 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 da. this will come back to me later. Okay. About okay. Twelve o'clock tonight. I'll go. Hey. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so then we need to talk about when did the first gasoline-powered car really come about? Well, sure. as you said earlier, and we've had this as a trivia question. We all know the name by the initials K B and G D. Carl Benz and Gottlieb Daimler of yep. Germany. And they f ran their first car in 1885, which was a gasoline-powered automobile. And they yep. were pretty and two much... two years later, it was for sale on the market. Yes. I mean, cars like that were. That's they, right. They demonstrated it in 85, and by 87, they were selling them. Not a lot, but they were. And, yeah, I mean, it's hard to think that that name goes back <clears throat> that far. Okay, so we watch... We're, we're talking pre-Revolutionary War, are we not? Um, 1885? Uh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Pre World War One, yeah. Okay, when was the revolution? I thought it. Oh, 1862. It was over with, correct? So Civil War was 1862. Uh, thank you. Civil War. Civil War. Civil War. Excuse me. Yeah. Bing, no, bing, we're bing. past the Civil War. So we're past the Civil War, and all we're of past sudden, the Spanish American War. In in comes all these, uh, yeah. these powered vehicles, yeah. and and it, and it started transforming the way our life was. Sure. And 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 so then you start looking at this, and you go, uh, Ben's. Uh, first car was 1885, and it moved in the internal um, powered. Ultimately, it birthed the independent car movement between the steam, sure. the gas, and electric. There was three now competing, and then by 1920, all the, the only thing was left was the gas powered. The electrics were pretty much limited to trolleys. Buses yeah. and things like that well, in cities. They went cities. back to being the work engines that yes. they started to yes. be. But you know what else was a big factor in the gas-powered, <clears throat> gas-powered vehicle becoming a like the 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 pedestrian vehicle, the 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 vehicle for every man. It was racing. It was racing that did it because the electric cars they they didn't race well. They didn't race them at all. Actually, but, they did. You know, the, they did. The a hill yeah, climbing but it, in the early days. It wasn't as popular. Yeah, but it wasn't as popular by by 1901. The Grand Prix, That's you right. know, was a thing. Yep. And the the first the first one, the average speed that, the, that won the first Grand Prix was 46 miles an hour, but it was a gas powered car, and people liked, according to the the lore around the Grand Prix, people liked two things: they liked the fact that they were fast, and they liked the sound. Oh. They liked the sound of the motor. Electric cars. Let's face it, not all that it's exciting. It's like playing a but, giant slot slot cars yeah which i mean is fun but let's it's... face it gas powered motors sound oh, cool yes. and they did back then too it was it and nobody was using mufflers so you got the full benefit of all that even at 46 miles an hour it was pretty exciting and people looked at that and went that's for me i gotta have one of those well it is and, and if you think about what happened when all of a sudden the next evolution in cars was when ford modern modernized the factory oh yeah and all a, a, an sudden, assembly line process assembly line process made a huge difference by 1919 he was he was absolutely fully mechanized in the assembly line and that changed the universe it changed it it, it changed yeah. everything it changed how everything was made from that point on and it's interesting to note historically fords were not the best car no out there at all no but they were the cheapest and, and they there were was a bunch of them and they could make them fast yes he could and and because of that, all of a sudden it changed the 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 the, the face of all the population. Now instead of oh, horse yeah. and buggy, you had a reliable a set Ford of Ford in every garage. Yes. Now think about what happened. Is we we talked about the gas, and we talked about how um, Rockefeller saw uh, he he became the tycoon. He bought up all his competition. Oh yeah. And oh, yeah. he was ruthless. I mean ruthless. I mean the yep. guy is anyway. Nonetheless. They started laying um, gas lines and gas fields and pipelines and supported. And now all of a sudden you had gas, gas stations 
in little right. rural towns because they could fill up these yep. little gas um, trucks and taker sure. trucks and take them to these little things, fill up these these things. And a lot of the, and, a and, lot of the gas stations were built in conjunction with fuel oil distributors. Uh, Those yes. guys were you know, had trucks that would take out fuel oil to the houses and and businesses that you know powered their stuff by coal oil or fuel oil, and then you could get gasoline for your car at the same place. You know it. And then you start buying your lubricants there, and you start buying everything sure. there, and all of a sudden you have convenience stores popping up everywhere, in conjunction <laughs> with with uh, gas stations. So I mean, you start sure. thinking about the evolution. So we just really pretty much banked it right up there to the end. We've got our break. Uh, we've got a great story coming up next Absolutely. that Brady's going to uh, tell us about, and we've got our trivia question. So don't go away. It's a good one this week. Stick with horsepower, us. chrome, and rust. Or it's time for Cars Confidential, and we're back with another story of Fenders, Fins, and Friends. What's up this week, Brady? This week, I am telling you, Lance Lambert has written words that I am going to say, pretending that I am he. No, um, this is actually a fun one. This uh, this is fairly deep into the book, but every once in a while, it's like you know you you kind of take that next bite of cereal and oh, there's raisins in that oh, one. Oh, two scoops at every. This one, yeah, this one's kind of got the scoop of raisins in it. This one's called "Look, but don't touch." Oh, there are two types of people who participate in car shows. Oh, you know where this is going. The car owners yes. and the general public attending the show. Now, the majority of the first type, the owners, they're either a little crazy or totally off their rockers. Yes. No yes. middle. <laughs> the second type, the public is made up of mostly healthy people with a few nutcases sprinkled in. Most people who display their cars are reasonable human beings who lead productive lives and are kind to animals and will give you the shirt off their back or blouse off their back. Uh, okay. I don't know about that. Uh, that is, that is, until you touch their car <laughs> at a show. Oh, yes. Oh. Then, then, for some reason, these cars have been around many decades. They'll instantly turn to dust if they're touched by anyone other than the owners. Yes, yes. Been there, done that. that apparently been yelled at. I've seen owners almost end up in fights when someone touches their candy apple painted baby. I should know because I'm one of them, he says. I'm not like that, by the way. <laughs> I'm Just not so either. That we're all clear. I don't care if you touch my car. Go ahead. You can put fingerprints on it. It's already got fingerprints on it. And they're mine. Um, over an eight-year period, I displayed my restored 1960 Thunderbird at about 200 car shows. I once had a father and son walk up, open the hood, which isn't easy. Because you have to pull a lever under the dash to pop it open. Oh. Their defense was that they were restoring a 60 T-Bird and they wanted to see the engine compartment. You could ask. Oh, well, that's going ask. a little bit too far. I, ah. At another show, I looked over to see a young lady sitting in my car, pushing the radio buttons as fast as she could. Oh. <laughs> I walked over, and as calmly as I could, I told her that the appropriate etiquette at a car show was to look and not touch, and you certainly don't climb into the car and hammer away at the radio. As she got out of the car, something on her bib overalls caught a portion of the upholstery and ripped out a button from the seat cushion. Oh! I'm a gentleman who will generally seek out the most non-confrontational way to look at problems not this time i went nuts as i screamed at her for the damage she'd done to my car she responded by looking at me and saying casually jeez man chill out i had two choices <laughs> or head or walk away yes yes i quickly contemplated spending the rest of my life in prison and decided that walking away was the best option saint peter should give me an extra cloud in heaven for that act of composure <laughs> So what's the point? Well, it's kind of like she walked up to a stranger's house and entered without knocking. And then being invited to enter, you ask car owners about their cars. You may even be invited to sit in the car. You'll definitely have questions answered. 
by the car's proud mama or papa. A few car owners will even let curious children sit behind the wheel and honk the horn. That is, unless they're wearing bib overalls. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, I mean, I can't tell you how many car shows I've been to. You're the same. Yep, you know, yep. you, you see people do things and you wonder, like, okay, did you think that this was, like, a ride at the grocery store where you put in the quarter and you can just get in and pound away on the thing because people are crazy. Although I have to share this story. It's a true story. One of our good friends of the show and uh, one of the, the Northwest's, you know, nicest people, uh, Carly Brogren has a wonderful um, custom car. It's a kit, but it's right. a beautiful car. Right. And I, I won't go into details, but the bottom line is she was at, I believe it was the Greenwood car show, but it was one of the big shows in the Pacific Northwest. And her car was there and she's very proud of it. It's a beautiful car. Um, and she walked away to get a soda or a coffee or something. And she came back and there was a guy running his hands over the car. And he wasn't doing anything horrible. He's just running his hands over the surface of the car. He had on a pair of sunglasses. And it was a beautiful sunny day. So she didn't really think much about it until she saw a woman with him who was talking with him in some sort of sign language and she was touching him the guy was blind oh and he had <clears throat> she had brought him to a car show simply for the tactile experience you know fiddling with that so there was nobody at the car and it was really a swoopy you know cool oh it car. is it is so he was feeling the car and then they would talk about it a little bit and then he would feel other parts of the car and they would talk about it a little bit so Carly came back and saw this and realized what was going on and talked to the woman, talked to the man. And she's, he, they said, we hope you don't mind. She said, no, normally I don't like people to touch the car very much, but you know what? Go do whatever you do. Yeah. And the guy ran his hands over the car for a good 15 minutes. She's got some of it on video. It is one of the most beautiful things I ever wow. saw. Yeah. It goes to show sometimes it's okay. Oh, you know, yes. she, oh, I can yes. wipe off fingerprints. It's not that big a deal. And this was something that this guy would never experience again. And I had, I mean, when she told me about the story, I had to say, look, you know, your car is pretty swoopy. No. It'd be a cool thing yes. to run your hands over. It would. So sometimes that's not a bad deal. And, th and then, of course, there's the other people who just want to bang on stuff. And we all know who those people are. Right. But we're fortunate to have a hobby that allows people to be okay looking and sometimes touching and sometimes not. But if you ask, the likelihood is at most car shows, you're going to get to be able to, you know, probably handle the thing at, at, to a certain extent. And you might even be able to get in and honk the horn. Yeah. And I, because I've done a couple shows um, that are on our YouTube channel, there are a couple uh, um, shows that are me videoing and me being videoed, interviewing different people with their cars yeah. And one of the guys, I, a couple of them, they said, get on in the car. And I sure. got shot with me in the car, and I got to talk to the guy, and, and they were really happy to do that. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're being Most featured on the, on, on the thing. But what I, what I, I'm, I want to touch, <clears throat> sometimes I want to touch a vehicle because I like, I'm going, that is such a phenomenal paint job. Sure. And I want to feel the surface and, and see that I, I, I'm a very tactile type person. Ask my wife, when we're walking around in uh, Vegas, I'm tapping the walls to see which ones are fake and which ones are real. I mean, <laughs> she'll go, what are you doing, Steve? I'm going, is this plastic or That's is this? That's uh, the reason you're uh, doing it. Uh, okay. I, I, yes, I do that because um, I'm very tactile. I like to feel and touch. But um, I had a situation. We were out filming a show, and I was – moving around between two cars and there was some stuff there and I brushed up against this other guy's car. I was, I was trying to look at the other guy's car and I right. kind of brushed it up and the guy's like, who you touched my, Oh, you, I think you did something to it. And, and I'm sure. like, uh, I'm, I didn't mean to, I, I didn't even know that. And you sometimes when you have things on your back, like a little backpack yeah. or something, it can brush along and when you only future, have three feet between cars, then you, you don't go in there. Well, you have to be very careful. It's your yeah. I mean, it you is just your have responsibility to be careful. as a car show, you know, spectator, not to drag your backpack along somebody's car. And it, you know, again, I, sometimes you want to get in and take a look. Ask first. It's always okay to ask. And first. there are the incidences where people are riding around on bicycles and other oh, sure. things. Sure. And uh, well, 
I got scrapes along the side of my cars because my kids, being young, just brrr, right between the well, cars. Well, but that's one thing in your driveway. It's something right. else at the car show. Yeah, and you, gotta, you, you don't want to confuse the two. <laughs> nah, that's right. Hey, we really do want to do want to thank Lance for uh, letting us read out of his book. I know he doesn't mind too much, but it's nice to play a little fun with him while we're doing it. Um, all of the books, Fenders, Fins, and Friends, and Grins, Gears, and Gasoline, they're available at Amazon. You can get them at uh, Barnes and Noble. Uh, he had on his Facebook page the other day another bookstore that you could get. Uh, some people are are off Amazon lately, and now I can't remember which one it is, but I'll uh, I'll find it. You can also go to the Vintage Vehicle Show website and order them through there if you really want to. Your bookshelf wouldn't be complete without them, and we know that. So listen, the Nathan Lipinski Weekly Trivia Question is coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Help us if you can. You're an El Camino, El Camino man. Hey, this is Around the Wheel. Welcome this is where we talk about the upcoming events and all kinds of other cool stuff that's happening around the country and and the Nathan Lipinski weekly trivia question wherein you may very well win your very own personal name on our certificate of, of uh, winner of the trivia contest and you could get your uh, horsepower chrome and rust barn fine dust uh, certificate. And indeed, we know, indeed, we know that if you pour the barn fine dust on your vehicle it will be worth four times as much because they'll think you found it in a barn and uh get, see uh, so last week what were you doing over there you're just fiddling around with i that. was pouring the pouring the barn fine dust I yes see. The, the invisible the dust. invisible dust um, it is so a virtual last award. week's question was pretty cool i'm disappointed <laughs> we didn't get an oh, answer oh no i know usually we do but i think i'm putting it down to the election People were weirded, weirded out by the election. Yep. The first of the modern cars, the first of the modern cars to have power everything. And modern cars, okay? They had aerodynamics design. They had stable um, uh, suspension, steerable headlights. That car is nearly lost to history. They only made, um, let's see, I think they made 51 of them, and there's only 12 left. Oh, yes. And that was the 1948 Tucker torpedo i had a feeling that was what it, it was, was a yeah. classic we there are a few around yeah. if you ever have a chance to see one please do because they are absolutely they, it was an innovative car it had power and aerodynamic design very good price too it was a really good price for what for what he was offering and big uh, the big three killed it uh, they wouldn't let him do it and uh he preston tucker was a, a visionary guy and he died penniless because of it however even though we didn't have a winner to this one, next week's question is a pretty good one, and I think we're going to get somebody on this one. This is actually kind of a salute to the stylist who designed the visual cues to almost every Chrysler cab forward and curvy design over the last 15 or 20 years. I mean, oh. he was kind of responsible for the look of the new minivans. But it was one guy, and if you know who that was, you too can get your name on the certificate for the horsepower chrome and rust barn fine dust you can email us at contact us at horsepower chrome and rust in fact you can email us for any reason if you want to tell us what you want to see on the show or suggest a guest or pimp your own uh, project that you're doing that'd be great you can also go to the website at the facebook page and just send us a message or a text it'd be great if you know who the designer of almost every modern chrysler curvy cab forward kind of thing was Give us a shout. Let us know, and we'll that give you the answers. I, uh, uh, is he still alive? Because um, he is. He uh, is. I might be try. I might have to try to track him down and get him on the show. I uh, would be kind of cool. That yeah, would be you cool. Could, you could get a hold of him. I love trying to find those kind of individuals yeah. that you don't kind of think about, but you're like, someone had uh, had the. Somebody did it. Somebody yep. did it. Was that, somebody. So. Hey, uh, last week we talked a little bit about the uh, uh, off-road event from Avance, yes. and it was on yep. the 23rd. It turned out to be a big success. I had a, a, a couple of guys who went, emailed me, and said everybody had a grand old time. It Excellent. was uh, basically Excellent. about a five-hour deal and uh, up in the, the mountains. Was there the much North snow, or is it just pretty much? Apparently just... some, but nothing that oh, was yeah, but that's fun, caused though. it to happen. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole point of going off-road. So, yeah, if you've got an event that's coming up, let us know what it is. There's going to be a big one coming up in uh, North Idaho. I'll tell you about that one next week. We're kind of doing planning. Cool, cool. Some of it this week coming up. 
Uh, and we're getting up to where we can almost look over the top of the hills and see car show season. So uh, we'll be talking about some of those yes, around the country, will. too. And if you have yep. one that you're going to do, send it to us at Horsepower Chrome and Rust, and we'll be happy to produce it, or not produce it, but promote it and uh, share it with everybody else. Well, I can tell you this, that um, talking with Dennis Roth, who's going to be a future guest on the show. Oh, right. Uh, he was telling me about some of the coolest little uh, – events that he's been to all over the United States, even during the COVID close down that a lot of people said, yeah. screw it, we're having it. And they've been some of the best things happening. All right. Well, hey, we know that you're out there. We really appreciate you listening. There's over a million of you every week, and we're glad you're there. We had a great time kind of giving you the beginnings of the history of the internal combustion engine. We're going to do more of that. It shows down the line. Check out the website for our upcoming and past shows. For Ron Foreman, who's still picking up his carport, Steve <laughs> Johan, I'm Brady Wright saying, Keep your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road, your foot to the floor. We'll see you next week on another Horsepower Chrome and Rust.